The famous science fiction author, Arthur C. Clarke, once famously said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And what I wanted to talk about today was the magic of designing those technologies. Designing technology has always been magic, but I think that now is a special time. Not that long ago, uh, when we would design software, we'd get it mostly done, and we'd bring somebody into our garage office or lab, uh, we'd watch them use the software, and when they got stuck or swore, uh, we'd write that down, <laughs> And we'd fix that software usability bug. And then we would maybe bring somebody else in, repeat the same thing. When they got stuck, fix that. After a couple times, uh, when we ran out of money or time or patience, we would release the software into the world. <laughs> and you have no idea what happens when you release it out into the world. And that's changed dramatically in recent years. Uh, today, if you log on to Google or Amazon or Facebook or Yahoo, uh, you're likely part of an experiment. Every day, designers are trying out different alternatives, and they are seeing what things work the best. I call this idea design at large, where it's real world at scale, and we're being able to compare alternatives and learn from what we're finding. What I wanted to share today was a couple of stories from uh, my graduate students and, and some of the companies and designs that have succeeded and others that haven't. And because um, I think that these successes are tremendously exciting, uh, but they don't happen all the time. You know, many startups fail. And what we're trying to do in the design lab at UC San Diego is to be able to build principles of what makes for effective design. Uh, this is my former master student, Mike. Uh, and Mike and his friend Kevin, in early 2010, uh, had a startup that was called Bourbon. Uh, Bourbon was an application that let you check in at a place and share a photo. And they had a bunch of things in the design that they knew just had to be true. Like, really, uh, you only wanted to be able to share photos with a few close friends, because who else would want to see these things? And it was all place-based, so you would check into a spot, and it would tally points, so there were these game mechanics to try and get you up on the, of the leaderboard. Burbit didn't go very far. Um, so Mike, Mike and Kevin tried again, and this one you may know uh, much more likely. Uh, their next application was called Instagram. Uh, Instagram has more than 400 million users worldwide. Uh, they had more signups in the first hour than Bourbon had in its entire history. Now, what's interesting about this is that Mike and Kevin were roughly right the first time. There is something about place and photos and mobile and all that, but they got a lot of the details wrong. And so when they started over, they tried a bunch of different things. One of my favorite examples of serendipity is that um, when they were building Instagram, they assumed, like with Bourbon, that close friends would be very important, that you'd only want to share stuff with close friends. But they were like, ah, we'll build that later. We'll release the first version without any authentication so that anybody could see anybody's photo. And as you know from Instagram today, the magic of being able to see celebrities and all sorts of folks, great photographers, just random people in different locations using photos to check the weather, all of that is part of the magic of what makes Instagram, Instagram. And this came about not because Mike and Kevin were smarter than anybody else, I mean, they're pretty darn smart, but because they tried lots of things. For a while, Mike had this thing where every Friday, he would try out a new design by bringing people in and testing it out. And so he just got more chances to try stuff than lots of other people did. Um, the second example I wanted to give is another former master student of mine, Akshay Kotari. And this is the Pulse newsreader. Uh, if you saw the early announcements of the iPad, you may have seen Steve Jobs demonstrate the Pulse newsreader on stage. What's great about Pulse is that, oh, thanks. 
Akshay and Ankit tried about 25 different prototypes early on, and they had no idea what was going to work. What, what does news reading on an iPad mean? They found that people really gravitated towards the much more visual ones. And so I talked to Akshay on the phone recently, and he told me that, uh, he's like, you know, it's weird. Something that was literally a class project in six weeks uh, is now something that serves news every day to 450 million people around the globe. Pulse was acquired by LinkedIn, and it's now LinkedIn's news source. And so again, we see the same thing with Akshay that we saw with Mike, that trying all these different prototypes really fast enabled him to get feedback and figure out the thing that would work. Uh, here's our third example. Uh, many of you may know and love this. This is the, uh, the Palm Pilot. And in 2000, uh, Palm sold nearly 8 million of these. It was the first handheld computer that people really loved. And so how did they figure out how to get the right functionality in a small package with a usable interface? It turns out that the journey to 8 million users begins with a block of wood. Uh, Jeff Hawkins, the founder of Palm, uh, in his garage, cut out a little piece of plywood. And it was about the size that he thought the Palm might be. And he brought him with it everywhere. This is the magic of design. He imagined that a piece of plywood was actually a functional Palm Pilot. And so Jeff would go to meetings, he would take notes. If he needed to call somebody, he would look up their information. And the advantage of driving design by prototyping, as opposed to by making a list in the boardroom, is that if you made a list in the boardroom, you'd have way too much stuff, and it would just be slow and unwieldy and never work. What Jeff was able to figure out by trying and living with the design was to figure out what are the few key things that are especially important. And if any of you are chemists out there, you have Boyle's Law, or you may have learned it in chemistry class. Uh, design has Boyle's Law also, actually. And the Boyle's Law of design is never go to a meeting without a prototype. And here you can see uh, when Microsoft first released Windows with a mouse, uh, they worked with a design team to build more than 100 different prototypes. And you might look at this picture and say, ah, that looks like what a designer does. There's 100 different forms that the designer made. But I look at this picture and I think that's 100 different questions that the designer asked, that each prototype really is a question. Should it be round or square? Should it have one button or two? Should it be the same size or different sizes? Uh, ergonomic or stylish? All of these different questions that a designer might ask. And so um, when I look at this, you know, I see that prototypes are questions and that the way that we can all be like designers is to ask lots of them. Uh, we're in the middle of a, a campaign and so I thought this would be a fun uh, example from politics. Uh, in the 2008 campaign, Dan Soroker left his job at Google uh, to go and help out a young politician who was running for president. And one of the things that Dan and his team did is that they tried out comparing alternatives of effective designs with, uh, with the Obama campaign. Some of the prototypes that we've seen at the beginning are really vastly different designs. I wanted to use this example to underscore that it can work for the small stuff too. Their original uh, homepage had about an 8% click-through rate on their sign-up button. And they wondered whether they could get an increased rate of donors, which is critical if you are a grassroots-driven political campaign, simply by changing the text on that button. So they came up with three alternatives. And you can take a guess as to which one you think worked. What's notable is that everybody in this campaign was super smart. Not everybody was able to guess which was most effective. Turns out that the Learn More button vastly outperformed the other three. And this brings me to a point that often we can use uh, principles to be able to understand why design is effective, and sometimes even use those to base our designs. There's a principle that psychologists know called commitment escalation, where you start with a small ask and then ratchet up from there. The Learn More button is a small ask. You're not saying, I want to give money yet. You're just saying, well, I'd like to learn a little bit more. And once they've got their foot in the door, you feel like, okay, well, well maybe I'll donate. I've had the same experience. I teach a, an online class on Coursera. We've had almost 300,000 people sign up for it. And what's really fun about teaching at large scale online is that you get so much more feedback about your instructional materials. And so the same experiences that Mike and Akshay 
uh, and Jeff and Dan had, we've been able to do that with our course materials. You put 300,000 eyeballs on, uh, on an assignment, and you're able to work out all the bugs and answer lots of useful questions. And for those of you who are interested, um, here's some of the student prototypes. Uh, people make all sorts of cool stuff. And again, you're seeing that these rapid prototypes, uh, the magic in them, like Jeff's block of wood, is we pretend that these are interactive systems uh, to be able to try out ideas early, get feedback, and figure out what the real problem to be solving is. I've shown mostly examples of professional design, and I wanted to close with something closer to home. Um, on social media recently, I asked friends, I, I just was like, all right, how have you used prototyping in your own everyday lives? And people came back with all sorts of stuff. You know, I posted this, I had no idea what anybody would, would come back with, if anything. Every two or three minutes, something new starts coming in. And it was really cool. So the first one that came in is Maria uh, prototyped her living room in painter's tape, where things might go. Uh, Ori prototyped a new iPhone holder. Uh, Eric had this really ornate prototype of, uh, of a home renovation. Uh, and Alexandra even prototyped her tattoos by wearing temporary tattoos for a month to figure out which one she liked best. That's something you definitely want to prototype before committing to. <laughs> And so to close, you know, the prototypes that we've seen today, the magic of them is that they instantiate a future that doesn't exist yet. And what designers do is we time travel just a little bit into the future with our prototypes. And once we know what the world is like there, we can send back these postcards that give information about what to really make. And like the folks on the last slide, I think this is something that all of us can do in our everyday lives. So happy designing. Thank you.